I know everybody's doing a prophecy update these days with all that's going on in Israel. Um, and uh, there's much news that could be covered, much information that could be covered. But what I do not want to be guilty of is newspaper exegesis. In other words, taking the headlines and what's going on in the world and imposing those upon the scripture. Um, Bible prophecy is important. Um, clearly, what we do know, as I've stated so many times before, is that there are many places in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where the prophets spoke of uh, things concerning the end, or that day, or those days. And included in those days, uh, a time in that day, in those days, in the latter day, um, or in the latter days, when Israel would be um, brought back into the land a second time, would undergo um, some form of uh, judgment and discipline. At the same time, the Gentiles, the nations, undergo some form of judgment. And then the um, fortunes of Israel are restored later upon the, the second coming or the coming of the Messiah. That there's a time for Israel in the future when their fortunes are restored. It's a land of milk and honey. Um, and they will enjoy all of their borders, which they have not enjoyed up to this point ever in history. Although Israel enjoyed coming into the land in the days of Joshua, and Israel's been in the land off and on since then. They fell under captivity to the Babylonians. Then they were able to come back into the land, and uh, temple construction began, that type of thing, and they stayed in the land, although um, enslaved. Um, up until about 70 A.D., Things turned upside down. Then we know from history there was a last gasp uh, effort by some, a small group, an incursion in 135 A.D. to try to come back into the land. Uh, the emperor, uh, the Caesar, did not like that. Um, they expelled them, pushed them out, and then had Jerusalem plowed under. So roughly since the first century, there really has not been anybody back into the land. Almost 2,000, you had 1,900 years of uh, no Israel officially in the land, although there, are, there have always been uh, Jews in the land, um, Bedouins, if you want to call them that. There have always been Jews in the land that never did leave, um, a small, small number. Fast forward to 1948, you know what happened there. In May 1948, after the Second World War, much sympathy from the United Nations for Israel. They decided to give them this little thin sliver of land. And uh, they weren't there but a few days when they came under attack by their neighbors. And there's game on again. And this is the history. This is the pattern for Israel um, ever since the Exodus. And uh, Israel's in that pattern now. So we, we pay attention to prophecy, um, not just to see uh, what in the world is uh, supposed to happen next, uh, although that's a fair enough reason. Uh, but main thing we're looking for is Christ, right? So we, want, we look at the things that are going on in the world, and we don't want to see if we can wedge it into the Scripture. We want, what we want to do is we want to try to read Scripture and understand Scripture well enough that uh, we can discern what is biblically supposed to happen next, not based on somebody's um, presuppositions, not based on somebody's dream or vision, or, or God told me I got a word from God. So we want to trust the Word of God. That's the only thing we've got that we can anchor ourselves to. So we want to look at the Word of God. With that in mind, we know that we moved into that day or the latter days because uh, we see that Israel came back in the land. And prophetically, biblically, that was 
next events on God's timeline that were described in the Old Testament prophets. That there would come a time in the latter days when I will bring you back into the land from all the countries a second time. And when I bring you back into the land a second time, you will never again be removed. Well, that kind of kicks things off. Then you have Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37, and you have the dry bones prophecy. Uh, you know, tell me, son of man, can these bones be made to live? And then you had the bones stack on top of each other, and they started to flesh out. And uh, then they became um, men. And that was uh, all a prophecy of Israel being restored in, in Ezekiel 36 and 37. So then... Um, what what is next in Bible prophecy after that? So we see the rest, the return of Israel back into the land. We see them under judgment, and we see the nations under um, God's judgment, and then we see restoration of Israel and the full appreciation, restoration, realization of all the Old Testament prophecies, and we see all those things happen under uh, Messiah sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem. But meanwhile, what is going on in Israel? Well, Israel's under under judgment. Um, they are. We've seen this pattern in the Old Testament repeatedly. And then they're enslaved. They go through this struggle for a time where they're enslaved, uh, like uh, Israel was in, in Babylon, you know, for 70 years. And, and, and um, finally, um, God begins to restore them. They, they cry out to God, and, and God hears their prayers. He hears their cries. He hears Daniel's prayers. And this, this cycle, though, we see happen all through their history. We see that cycle a lot in the judges. So you've got in the whole world 14, 15 million Jews in the whole world. And um, the population over there in Israel is increasing, um, as it was predicted in, in the Old Testament, said what's going to happen, and they were going to start coming back into the land. Now they're under judgment, and these things are happening um, to them, we need to pray for Israel. To pray for peace in Israel is to be praying for the Messiah to take his throne and to establish his kingdom. We'll have um, paradise found. He'll um, restore things to the way that uh, the garden was, back to the new heavens and new earth. The world will be restored. Jesus will be on his throne. It'll be a, a wonderful and glorious time. And um, so we're, we're looking for that. So when you pray for peace in Israel, you're praying for that, which means believers going into the kingdom. It means um, the salvation of, of Israel. God promised Israel that, um, that they would be uh, restored, that they would um, be believers, that they would look on him whom they pierced. Of course, not every last Jew, only a remnant. Um, during this time of, of great trial upon the earth, or great tribulation, um, that Jesus spoke of, Daniel 9.27, Daniel heard from the angel uh, Gabriel, and we see played out in the middle of the book of Revelation. And so we look at these events, and um, we see where it's headed, but meanwhile, um, the question is naturally, going to come up. Um, well, how do we know when these events are coming up? And I get these questions. Are are we part way in the tribulation now? What's happening now? Or is this Gog and Magog? Um, you know, is it this? Is it that? And how close are we? Are we not? You know, is the, is the rapture close? Is the second coming close? Lots of questions. And, and it, okay, that's fine. We need to be studying the scripture. And unfortunately, we don't get a lot of um, Bible prophecy teaching from good sources. A lot of our seminaries will do uh, an overview of Bible prophecy, mostly systems. You know, here's here's what the pre-tribulational, pre-millennial position is. And here's what the all-millennial position is. Here's what the post-millennial position is. And, you know, um, so we, we hear all these uh, pre-rapture, preterism, mid-trib, um, pre-wrath, post-trib rapture, and uh, multiple raptures, uh, and there's a couple of different names for those, and and so it's it, it can get kind of confusing and kind of daunting, and unfortunately we don't get a lot from uh, pulpits or in seminaries on that, just 
general systems are covered in seminary, like a, like a survey, a Bible survey. What I want to do is I, I wanted to hit just a couple of quick highlights. What, fair enough, so what are you looking for now? What, what you're looking for now is there are a couple of things that are described in the end um, as really being um, relatively early in the restoration of Israel, the return of Israel, um, and that day and in those days, some of the things that are supposed to happen. One of the prophecies is Isaiah 17, 1, and it's about Damascus being destroyed, completely and utterly destroyed, where it's a city no more. Currently, it's still a city, and they still have an airport. Something could happen to where uh, Israel, sent, Israel sent out a warning. It came from Netanyahu. And it was, I've only been able to find it in Hebrew. It was on ynet.com. It was not in, in, in the English version. It was not in the German version. It was not in the French version when I looked. It was only in Hebrew. And it was a warning that to Nasrallah in the north, to the north of Israel, but predominantly Lebanon, but Lebanon and Syria, okay? I'll just put, put it that way, that they will take out Damascus. They will not be merciful if they permit Hezbollah to come down through their borders and uh, similarly invade or attack Israel. Something could happen where Israel could be the ones to take out Damascus to where it is a city no more. The scriptures do not say um, who is this going to, going to do that. Because they made this threat, and to turn up the heat on Israel and to make uh, Israel make even worse, it'd be really easy for Iran, for Russia, for some other third party, if I can put it that way, to take out Damascus and blame it on Israel, saying, look, they did it. Netanyahu said he was going to do it. Look what he did. Oh, this is awful. Look at all the people dead on the, on the streets. So whether Israel does it or not, it's really easy for something like that to happen and for them to get the blame. So we're, we're watching that. Now the other question that I get is, is it Psalm 83? I've always been kind of a little bit skeptic, skeptical of Psalm 83 going, well, you know, it's a list and it's about, kind of like it's about a war and their enemies attacking them. And there's a list of some, some, some uh, groups of people and, and Israel never at one time was in a big skirmish with all these nations. So a lot of people look at Psalm 83 and say, well, maybe that's a future kind of a war. And it's a different group of people than the Gog and Magog war that we see in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So what is this? So just as an overview, we could look at this and we could say, well, maybe there is something to that. The, the Psalm 83 enemies would be those that are closer into Israel. And then Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog Magog is further out. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 are further out groups than this um, Psalm 83 group. Okay, so so I would say if you see those groups, those areas um, in a coalition, Moving against Israel real soon, then you, you can say, hmm, okay, so Psalm 83 was a thing. Um, that's, that's the next thing that happens. If Psalm 83 isn't really a thing, and I'm, I don't know that I'm 100% sold on that, but if it's not really a thing, then things can be really um, fluid right now, and it could things could line up as far as the setting of the stage for Gog and Magog. Now, I will say about Ezekiel 38, that when you get into verse 17, 18, 19, uh, you start seeing God's great anger and his wrath. What do we know about God's great anger and his wrath? Well, we know from 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5 that we are not appointed unto wrath. Uh, Revelation 3.10 says something, something similar, that there is a trouble that is coming upon the whole world, and um, Jesus says he, he's going to rescue us from that. So it's the whole world is going to rescue us from that. And that it's going to be a time of trial for who? For those who dwell on the earth. 
not for us who dwell on the earth, or you who dwell on the earth, for those who dwell on the earth. So where are we? So we're not appointed to wrath. Uh, instead, we have the word uh, rapture, harpazo in the Greek. Um, rapimir in the, in the Latin is where we get the, uh, the term for the rapture, and, and that's in uh, 1 Thess Thessalonians 4. First uh, Thessalonians four seventeen. So there is a rapture in the Bible because it's it's there. It says rapture. It says harpazo, and we meet the Lord in the air. So shall we be with Him forever and ever? Not, not everybody's going to die, but you know, it's, it, we find that too. First Corinthians fifteen, that uh, some of us will be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, but the dead in Christ will go first. That kind of stuff. So we we have all that kind of language. So I have other videos, you know. Uh, uh, down, let's see which, which my, my, my finger on my screen is, but down there, uh, click on, on uh, my name, and there's a whole list of videos, and you can look at videos about in the twinkling and, and things about the rapture, and I get more verses about that that demonstrates um, the truth of, of some of that stuff biblically. Um, so Ezekiel 38, it, although it could kick off, and we could be like now in early stages of, of Ezekiel 38's Gog and Magog War. Um, the church won't be here when it's actual wrath. Now, what does that look like in Ezekiel 38? What it looks like in Ezekiel 38 is God is telling this person, Gog, that thoughts were going to enter into his head, and he's going to say, hmm. And he's going to decide to come in and enter into Israel. God is leading him there to judge him. Yes, it's to um, discipline Israel, to get their attention, to get them to call out to him. Not Don't depend on your Iron Dome. Don't depend on your weapons in your IDF. Don't depend on the United States. You're, you're going to find yourself alone. You call out to me. But meanwhile, God's going to bring the Gog and Magog coalition through the mountains of uh, Israel into Jerusalem, and there he's going to judge them. And it says those terms that God's going to, it's going to be a hook in the jaw. And God says, I'm going to lead you by the nose, he tells Gog. And Gog is going to be killed in the hills outside of Jerusalem, ultimately. Um, so notice that um, outside of Jerusalem. So that part of the war will probably go pretty quickly. They won't even make it uh, all the way into Jerusalem. Now, some of, you know, um, some militants might make it in there. Who knows? Um, who knows how involved that could be? But um, the major part of the forces are destroyed on the surrounding hills, um, West Bank, outside of, of uh, Jerusalem. And it's God's wrath. And God is bringing this stuff to bear, uh, to judge uh, Israel for their unbelief, their unbelief in the Messiah, because they missed it, and uh, he came. And also on the nations who persecuted his chosen people and came against his people and his land. And uh, so uh, that all is the purpose for that. A lot of details in there to read, and you have to probably read it, read Ezekiel 38 and 39 several times to get to flesh out some of the details. And there's a lot of... Um, Good information out there, and there's a lot of bad information out there, but it is wrath. I think particularly Ezekiel 38, 19 describes God's wrath. So who is that, though? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll see uh, Magog in there, and some people will dispute who exactly Magog is. Um, Magog is thought to be um, Russia. Some say, nope, it's not Russia, it's Turkey. Some say, well, it's Russia. It's a little bit of Russia and Kazakhstan. Like I said, the, the borders from ancient times when these prophecies were written uh, and uh, versus now, a little bit blurry. Definitely north uh, of Israel, though, is, is um, we, we, know, we know Russia's going to be involved, at least funding and provi providing um, weaponry and so forth. They're involved now, right? They're providing funding and weapons and technology to Iran. Iran is funneling it over to Gaza, to Hamas, uh, and, and probably to Hezbollah. Okay, so Russia on some level is going to be there. Um, now, Rosh, 
Some people say Rosh is Russia because it sounds like Russia, but languages don't always work that way. Rosh, Rosh also in some languages means head. So Rosh, it could be the head of the coalition. It could be a person um, in the uh, Egyptian. Uh, Pastor J.D. Farag is fond of pointing out that that in uh, Egyptian, you know, it's Rus is the head. So it could be that. But either way, um, it, we already know Rush is involved, so we're not real clear on exactly who Magog is and what Rosh means, but it means the head. A lot of people think it means the Antichrist, that he's going to be um, directing events here, um, perhaps, uh, but, but Antichrist cannot be Gog because Gog gets killed in the hills, and we know Antichrist goes all the way through that seven-year tribulation period. Persia is Iran. We know they're involved. We know there's a coalition. Russia has signed a coalition with Iran and also with Turkey. So they're already um, uh, close-knit and, and uh, tightly tied together. Um, Meshach, Tubal, and Tugarma, that's all regions that are now in Turkey. That's directly north of um of uh, Israel. Um, Meshach is, is near Moscow. Uh, Tubal is, is some of Turkey and Georgia area, Tugarma, Turkey, Armenia. So some of that territory. Ethiopia and Kush we know are northeast Africa. So we see some Ethiopians um, in there. Um, we know that also in Africa is Somalia. So we could see some Somalis coming in there. So uh, everybody might decide to join that party. Uh, Libya, Libya is already a little bit involved. They've already found some involvement in Libya there now. Um, Gomer is Germany, particularly East Germany, a little bit of some people from Poland and Czech Republic uh, because there are some um, Muslim citizenry there now in those areas. So not necessarily officially those countries will be involved, but some people from those territories. Muslims from those territories. Sheba and Dedan is off the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia. Um, their involvement, I think, I believe, as I recall, their involvement, though, is uh, they will not actually be there present. They're, they will not come on the side of Israel, but, you know, they have an agreement with Israel that they're working on right now, that they're hammering out. Um, but they're going to raise a protest, which means... You, that's not nice. You guys shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, uh, although they are they are Sunni Muslims, and and many of the rest of these are not Sunni Muslims, but are Shia Muslims. So, um, they could be just and as far as Muslim community goes, they're a little bit smaller than some of their surrounding territories. So they might just sit back and kind of wait and see what takes place, and they might raise a protest. But it doesn't look like they're going to be sending any forces out in the Gog and Magog war and supporting Israel. Uh, where's the United States? The United States, we might be busy with problems of our own. How many people are coming across the border? Um, you know, when they see people come across the border, all they see is, you know, they just see brown people across the border. From where in the world are they? What is their religion? Um, what about sleeper cells? That kind of thing. And um, all of our financial woes, our political woes, things like this, and um, stirring things up between the United States and uh, and China. You know, China also has an agreement with Iran, and uh, and China depends heavily upon Iran for oil. So Iran could decide to keep us pretty busy, or Iran, uh, China could keep us pretty busy, or worse. Um, while Iran is is involved in this invasion, this coalition. Um, so we see Libya in there. I think I already mentioned that's going to be uh, put. They're involved as put and also as Libya. Uh, we also have mentioned in here Tarshish, uh, the, the young lions of Tarshish. No one's real sure who that is. Some say it's the far west, like Great Britain, uh, Germanic areas. So Tarshish could be that area. Um, and uh, the young lions of Tarshish could be those nations who came out of, like, Great Britain, which would be uh, New Zealand, 
Canada, Australia, the United States. So we are the young lions of Tarshish, and Tarshish is the older one. It's the, the original place that we all came from. And it could be that, uh, you know, we're going to be raising a protest too, but not there involved directly in that war because of, you know, for whatever reason that, and uh, again, we don't want to read into the text too much what, what isn't there. You might have other ideas and, and lots of people do. And some are, some ideas are just as, are as good as any. We'll find out when we get there. So those are the things to watch for the, the, the different nation states. Psalm 83 uh, looks like is a very good opportunity here to um, see, to keep an eye on the news and see how these nations play out. Um, it's, it's very distressful what's going on over there in Israel. Pray for those people. Pray for those families, families all over the world who've lost people, um, families all over the world who are suffering right now, um, great loss, um, horrific. You know, some of us have seen the images. It's hard to watch, hard to bear, hard to think about. Um, but pray that somehow God uses this to draw people closer to him and closer together. We know things are supposed to get horrific in the very end, but this is a chance for God to step in and say, roll up his sleeves and say, now watch this, and which he does during the Gog and Magog War. All kinds of miraculous, miraculous things will happen. We've seen this in the past where weapons fly in and none of them explode or they blow up in the air for no reason. Uh, God divinely intervenes himself um, without need for any Iron Dome or anything like that. God will divinely step in and Israel will be thankful and crying out to God. Um, so it will be an answer to prayer. Uh, pray for, you know, pray for the Palestinians who are trapped and under the rule of Hamas. Yeah, they're, it, it, you know, you could say, well, they're the ones that elected and put those people in charge over there, and then they, you know, let them overrun them. Well, you know, we're all guilty of that, putting the wrong people in charge with our votes or whatever. And then what happens is if you're not armed, you have no power. You're just kind of a victim there to whatever. And you just keep your head down and try to stay alive. And that's what a lot of Palestinians stuck in Gaza, their condition. Um, it's tempting to want to pray and... Uh, I understand what we pray God's wrath down on Gaza and um, on Hamas, and they certainly need it. But, um, you know, also I would, I would encourage you to pray that uh, some stories come out of this to where, you know, giving their lives to Jesus Christ and repenting, wouldn't that be amazing? Because most of those people over there um, are demonic. They're demon-possessed. To do some of the things they've done. But God can save the demon possessed if he wants to. And they all need mercy. We all need mercy because um, without the mercy of Jesus Christ um, on the cross for our sins, shedding his blood for us, we would all end up going to the same place. We would all end up in the lake of fire. We would all end up in hell. Because some of us sin a little bit less or differently than others doesn't mean we're, we wouldn't all end up in the same place. Pray that, pray that they get mercy. Pray that the Jews over there repent and uh, come to realize Jesus is their Messiah. He's coming again. And that there's a false Messiah coming. Jesus said that uh, another is coming in his name as the Messiah. In him you will believe. And that's what's going to happen next. And that's the so-called Antichrist or pseudo-Christ, pretend Christ, quasi-Christ. It's going to be a pretender. Um, people will believe it for a while um, until the middle of the week, the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. That's another story. Um, other videos about that. Again, if you, if you, you know, um, look down there, and click on my name and look at some of those videos, this whole series in the book of Revelation and other books, things having to do with Gog and Magog videos and all that kind of stuff if you want more information. But that's what we're looking for now is those nations, see who gets involved. Um, no, so we, no, we are not in Gog and Magog yet. Um, and we as believers will not see all of Gog and Magog because that's God's wrath and we're not supposed to be here for God's wrath. So read 
First Thessalonians 4 and 5 uh, about wrath and the tenor there about, but us and um, them, but then but us. We're light, they're darkness. So those days aren't supposed to overcome us like a thief in the night. It's supposed to overcome them just like uh, the flood um, in the days of Noah. The ones who are caught like a thief like a thief in the night were caught unawares were the unbelievers in the area. Even though Noah had been building an ark for many, 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 many years, they still got caught off guard. Pray for peace in Israel. Pray for the second coming. Pray for Christ on his throne. That's all for now.